hears us, but he answers us. Amen? He is a loving, loving father. So we're going to continue with chapter 4 of Ephesians today. I'm breaking it into two parts. Um, I hope you all realize that Ephesians you could do a year on, to be honest. But uh, <laughs> So we're going to do Ephesians um, 4 through 16 today, and then we're going to pick up with 17 uh, down to the end, 32 next week. Amen? So, Father, we just want to invite your Holy Spirit, the one who wrote this book, to bring forth your words of life to each and every one of us. Lord, we are your children. You are the potter. We are the clay. Lord, just as our brother just shared, we're all in a formation process. And we thank you, God, for your tenderness, your gentleness. But, Lord, I especially thank you for your truth. Because it is the truth of the Word of God that brings change, lasting, permanent, eternal change into our hearts. And so, Father, we just invite your Spirit to be the one that brings forth this Word today in Jesus' name. Amen? Amen. I want to recap, if we can go into the first PowerPoint, um, just a couple of uh, thoughts, which obviously we've already covered. Pastor Lisa covered Ephesians chapter 1. I want us to just read how wonderful these words are, because this is who you are in Christ. You see, we so need that transformation. We need our thinking. We're going to talk about that next week, renewed, because our thinking is carnal. Our thinking is fleshly. Our thinking is human. Our thinking is what we say natural. Uh, but it is totally void of God. And it works against God. Our carnal minds fight. They're at enmity with God. So we want to look at who we are in Christ. Ephesians 1.3 says we are blessed with every spiritual blessing. Just think about that. These are things to proclaim over your life daily. Ephesians 1.4, we are wholly blameless and covered with Christ's love. Ephesians 1.5-6, we are adopted as God's children. 1 7, our sins are taken away and we are forgiven. 1 10 11, we will be brought under, lead, under Christ's leadership and the Holy Spirit's. 1 13, we are marked as belonging to God by the Holy Spirit. You have a mark on you. You are marked by God. And in the heavenlies, everyone knows the children of God. We bear a mark literally upon us. 2 6, we have been raised up to sit with Christ in glory. 2.10, we are God's work of art, his workmanship. 2.13, we've been brought near to God through the blood of Christ. Oh, yeah. Ephesians 3.6, we share in the promises of Christ. All of his promises are for us as well. 3.12, we can come boldly and with confident assurance into God's presence. We talked about that last week. That, that just blows our minds, and it should. That you, as a blood-bought, believing son or daughter of the living God, you can walk boldly into the throne room of the Lord. Amen. That's what our brothers shared. That's what he did. They walked boldly into the throne room of God, not based on their own merits, but based on who Christ is and what Christ has done in them. That when the Father sees us, he sees us covered under the blood of the Lamb. That is our mark. That is our seal in the heavenly places. So we're going to go into Ephesians 4. And as we do that, Ephesians 4 is all about unity in the spirit. It's unity in the spirit. How God wants his believing church to be unified. And as we do that, we're going to see it's not only <clears throat> God's plan, but how he really wants that brought about. So Ephesians 4, 1 through 2. Therefore, the prisoner, I, the prisoner of the Lord, Paul is saying, appeal to, beg you to walk and lead a life worthy of the divine calling to which you have been called with behavior that is a credit to the summons of God's service. I hope we all feel convicted on that. That's an ouch. Living as becomes you with complete lowliness of mind, that's humility, and meekness, unselfishness, gentleness, mildness, with patience, bearing with one another, and making allowances because you love 
one another. The word of God is saying here, humility in our heart is the key to unity in the body. We have to be humble in ourself and be able to look at that other person, walk with that other person, bear that other person, not see ourselves as above anybody. You know, somebody has said with great wisdom, the foot of the cross is even ground. Nobody's standing there a little more puffed up than the next person. The ground at the cross is even. We know we all deserve something we, by God's grace, will not get eternal separation from him. But we need to understand that living out that life of a Christian, anybody here would say, oh, that's just a piece of cake. That, that's really, really easy. Because being a Christian goes against our natural human instincts. What's our natural human instincts? Eye for eye, tooth for te- tooth. You did to me, well, you see what you're getting back. And that's how the world works. That's how we work separate from Christ. So what God is saying to us all throughout this word is as we yield ourselves on a daily basis, sometimes on an hourly basis to the Lord, he creates in us a desire to obey him. He creates in us a desire that says, you know what, I need to shut up right now. He creates in us a desire that says, I need to let this go and not make such an issue out of it. He does that work in us. Christ in you, the hope of glory. It's not you or I saying, well, you know what, today I'm going to get up and I'm going to live this nice little Christian walk. See how far you get in that determination. Because when it's based on self, it fails. Self is sinful. Self is self-centered. Self says, I want for me, I don't care about other people. And before you and I were born again, that's how we operated. Think about it. We were just selfish people. The world is selfish, separate from Christ. So once we come to Christ, as we've already read, we are seated in heavenly places positionally, spiritually. We're seated there. But conditionally, we're all in this room. Conditionally, you're rubbing shoulders with that person next to you. Conditionally, you may have a big fat issue with the guy in the last row. Sorry, Bobby. And so you have to understand that God is at work with us so that in this earth realm, we start to evidence who he really is. And that will be totally foreign to your human nature and my human, human nature. So Paul is saying in Ephesians 1, I am begging you, you need to live and walk a life that is worthy of the calling to which you have been called. And it's going to take humility. It's really going to take daily, daily surrender. Let's look at our next one. We need to understand that people are watching our life. Can they see Christ in you? Probably if we answer that honestly, we would say some days better than others. How well are you really doing as his representative in the world around you? And that starts at home, doesn't it? We can't escape there. It'd be so much easier to escape there and go to the outside world because the outside world you're not rubbing as closely as you are with the people you are living with. There needs to be the reality of the Holy Spirit's control over our life on a daily basis as witnessed by those around us. We need to be going to the Lord on a daily basis and say, Lord, this is who I am. I am surrendering to you. I'm asking you, Holy Spirit, guard my mouth. Let me say nothing separate from you. Let me, you know, guard my eyes, guard guard what I'm hearing. Let me be surrendered to you. We need to do that as soon as we get up in the morning so that our day is covered and we will see God act on our behalf. So when you're in the midst of a difficult circumstance and that flesh in you says, you'll get that check from the Lord, like just be quiet, leave it alone, don't say it now, whatever it may be. Now, at that juncture, we have a decision to make. In that split second, we have a decision to make. 
to either go with what the Lord is saying to us or just let our flesh take off and go its own way. When our flesh takes off and goes its own way, which we all do at times, we have to understand people around us will suffer the effects. I want us to think about that. It's not just you who suffer the effect or me that suffers the effect. People around us suffer the effect of our sinful choices because that sin is falling out on them, whether in an attitude, in a wrong behavior, whatever way it's coming forth, they too are dealing with it. The world judges us because we're saying to the world, we're different from you. But does the world really see us as different from them? Or do we compromise? Do we go along with things? You know, do we use a, a sloppy concept of grace that, oh, I can do whatever I want to do and God will just forgive me? Mm -mm. So the world looks at us and says, oh, you call yourself a Christian? Then in essence, you're supposed to be living to a different standard than the world is. Do our actions really match up to our own words? Do the actions match up to your own words? I've shared this story before. I think it might have been in Tender Hearted, but it comes to me. I'm going to share it quickly. Many years ago, I was uh, <clears throat> working on my, um, my bachelor's in social work, and I was interning with someone, and uh, she had to go to court. She was caught up in a whole a suit. It was a divorce situation between her and her husband. He wasn't paying child support and so forth. So we go into Mineola and we walk into this uh, courtroom and it is jam-packed with people. I mean, you're really rubbing shoulders with the person next to you. And so, you know, people are just talking, minding their own business, doing whatever. And all of us, and the girl with me was also a believer. We were talking, we were praying, you know, she'd have a good result from this. But out of the corner of my eye, I see a man in the hall, and he comes in, and he has papers in his hand. And uh, he, he looks around the room. There's a couple of hundred people easily in this room. And all of a sudden, you know, he walks up to the, the first row, and he's, he looks very friendly, dressed very nicely. And, you know, he kind of looks and, and hand this person a, a paper. And then, you know, this person, hi, hi, how are you? Very friendly, lovely. People are receiving this from him. And he starts going through this whole room. So he comes over by us, and uh, I realize what he's giving is a track. He's, he's a born-again believer. It was a wonderful track and so forth. And so he gets three-quarters through this room, and all of a sudden his name gets called. And there's a, a social worker out in the hall, and she says, you know, Mr. Jones, you know, please come out here. And so he walks out, and... Not that I think she should have done this in front of people, but she did. She got him just to the exit door, and she said, your salary is being garnished. You haven't been paying your child support for the last blah, blah, blah months. Your family is suffering. You did this. You didn't do that. You did whatever. And you saw people in the room take the track he handed out, crumple it up, and throw it away. Why? His actions did not line up with his words. See, we lose testimony that way. We lose our witness that way. Now, nobody is perfect. We understand that. But the bottom line is there has to be a reality to us saying, I am a Christian, I am a believer, and I will walk a certain way, and I will make every effort under the guidance of the Holy Spirit to do that. Amen. Do our actions actions line up with words. It's not just about talking the talk. It's easy to say words. It's a whole lot harder to have the actions. Next one. Ephesians 4, 10 through 11 says, He who descended, of course Christ, is himself also he who ascended far above all the heavens so that he might fill all things. The word is saying he even went down into hell after his uh, death and obvious resurrection. He went down into hell and revealed himself, whether in the heavens, under the earth, that he is Christ. He is God. He is the great I am. He proved himself of who he is in authority 
by his action. His action of being resurrected from that cross proved to all the powers and principalities that he was truly who he said he was. And so verse 11 says, and he gave some apostles, some as prophets, some as evangelists, some as pastors and teachers. And this is called the fivefold ministry in the church. This fivefold ministry is the foundation that Christ has laid so that his church, his body of people would function in a healthy, loving way. Not dysfunctionally as we all have in our, in our families of origin. Amen? There are many other giftings. There's administration giftings. There's ministerial giftings. But fivefold is just a baseline. It is a foundation of government that Christ has said, I have proven to every entity in the heaven, on the earth, below the earth, and I am going to establish now my authority on the earth the way I want it established. And that's what fivefold is all about. He is proving he is God, and he is saying government comes from me. Government comes from God. It doesn't come from the USA. Government comes, the idea and principle and standard of government is set in the word of God. He has a divine order, a divine place, a divine structure that he once followed on the earth because he has reason for this, and we're going to see this. Next one. Each office, apostle, prophet, evangelist, teacher, pastor, those are the five different categories, carries its own distinct anointing and has its own individual work. For these offices to work together and accomplish the building up of the body of Christ, they too must recognize even their own differences and be yielded and submitted to one another. Remember what Paul is talking about, humility, submission, surrendering to authority. He is setting out a foundational structure in the word of God through the Holy Spirit, that the Holy Spirit wants followed in the body of Christ today. Each of these offices are directly responsible to the Lord and are directed by the Holy Spirit for a specific work of service. Look, God has a plan. God has an agenda. God doesn't get in line with our plan and our agenda. We are to get in line surrendering our plan and our agenda and get in line with him, with who he is and with what he wants. As we submit to leadership in the fivefold ministry, you begin to see blessings come forth in your life. We bear a strong responsibility for the Lord. These, when people are called into ministry, it's God taps you on the shoulder and says, I want you to be an apostle. I want you to be a pastor. I want you to be an evangelist. Is everyone going to be in that category? Of course not. They're going to be operating in other giftings that God has placed within them. But the point I want to make is it's not for us to say, this is what I want, and you know what, God, I'm setting myself up accordingly. When people do that, you will watch that fail. But when you submit yourself to the Holy Spirit and say, what do you want? You watch God begin to establish order of the calling, the gift, the ministry of the Holy Spirit within your life. Now, the reason, one of the reasons, which let's look at our next one, Margaret, um, for fivefold ministry, it's telling us that because of Christ's authority, Key word, over all things that he has established in order. It's a pattern that he wants carried out here on the earth realm by his body to demonstrate our yieldedness to his Holy Spirit. That we don't do things as the rest of the world does things, but that we are surrendered to his ways of doing things. This displays him as Lord, not only Savior, Lord, 
much of the Christian believing church has received, obviously, Christ as Savior, but they don't let him operate as Lord over their life. And I'm going to show you why that is, and we all have it within us. It's called rebellion. You and I at heart are rebels. Now, you may say that's not true, but you know it is. And the reality is if you watch little bitty children, if we had those little two, three, four-year-olds, and you tell them, no, there's not a parent in here that doesn't see that rebel arise. Am I correct? Right in your face. Now, isn't that interesting that nobody ever, you know, sat Josiah down and said, you know what, Josiah? Let me teach you how to sin. Let me teach you how to be a rebel. Let me teach you how to tell mommy and daddy, no, I'm not doing that. It's innate within us. It's our sin nature. And you see it in somebody who's six months old to six years old to 60 years old. It's there. It's part of us. And so we need to understand that God has a plan to establish government on the earth that will display submission and yieldedness to him. Not the letter of the law, you better, you better, an obligation. It's not about the law. It's about a governmental structure. Now, there is a reason for this. And the Lord really spoke this to my heart this morning. And what he was saying was, I want my church to display a true humility, a true yieldedness. A true surrender. Do you know why? Because we are going to be the oddity in the world today. Let's read about the world we live in today. In the last days, difficult times will come. For men will be lovers of self, lovers of money, boastful, arrogant, revilers, disobedient to parents, Ungrateful, unholy, unloving, irreconcilable, malicious gossips, without self-control, brutal, haters of good, treacherous, reckless, conceited, lovers of pleasure, rather than lovers of God. Holding to a form of godliness, although they have denied its power, the word says, avoid such men as these. That is 2 Timothy 3, 1 through 6. So the word is saying to us, the days that we live in, the rebellion of people has risen to an all-time high. And let me share something, church. As the world and the economy comes crumbling down, that high is going to reach a whole other level of high. Because you will watch the true sin nature of people come forth who are rebelling against any form of government, authority, or law in their life. And so the word is saying, I, the Lord, do not want my body to look like the world. We are not to look like the world rebellious, lovers of self, a gossiping, irreconcilable, a haters of good, lovers of pleasure rather than ourself. So God is saying, I want to confront the world with people who are really sold out to me. And that sold out quality evidences and witnesses itself as love to one another and love to the authority structure that I, the Lord, have placed in effect. Amen. It is vital to understand this. God is not into names, positions, or titles. He is into a heart that says, I'm sold out to you. And whatever he wants to do with that heart, so be it. We need to understand that, that lawlessness in the day we live in is going to so arise that
that Christianity will be literally the standard, the vanguard in its face, saying, no, there are a people who do submit and surrender to the living God, who do honor him, who will be obedient to him. And out of our obedience to him, we will evidence it in our relationships one with the other. Those are choices we have to make, church. We have to make that that choice. That rebel is alive in every single one of us. Let's look at our next one. So in his word, the Holy Spirit unveils the fivefold ministry and the authority that Christ has delegated. It's a delegated authority to those called into the fivefold government of God. This is the government on which Christ builds his church. And we just read the apostle, the prophet, the teacher, the evangelist, the pastor. All authority comes from God, and he delegates into that position a responsibility that that person will stand before the Lord to carry out. Now, I can speak on behalf of two other pastors sitting here. That's no responsibility you want to just sign up for. You better know that God has called you to that because of the price that will be expected of you to pay. God is not into egos. He is not into popularity contests. He's looking for a heart that says, you know what? You can crush me, and I'm going to do what you want me to do. And I'm going to carry out the assignment you have given to me. And I'm going to be yielded so that your body can come first. And so that your body, Lord, can come forth. Oh, yes, there is a price to pay. Make no bones about it. Because your life is not your own. But when we receive Christ, we have been purchased with a price. And reality, none of our lives are our own. That seal that we talked about earlier of the Holy Spirit is the marking of the Spirit of God, the third person of the Trinity, and he marks us and says, this one is mine. Different from the other millions who live on the planet, this one belongs to to me. The evidencing of that comes out through yielding our will to the Lord on a daily basis. So why has God put these places, positions, titles into place? Let's look at our next one. We see the answer in verse 12 and 13. For the equipping of the saints for the work of service. Pastors, teachers, evangelists, prophetic, apostolic is to equip the body. In other words, God is saying this person is not perfect, but obviously has passed some qualifications in the course of their walk with the Lord. And God is saying, I can trust that person now to come forth in this position But that position bears tremendous responsibility to the Lord and to the body of Christ. So we need to understand that God calls us to minister and equip the saints so you can all be about the work of service, the gifts of God that God has put in you. It's not about somebody sitting back and saying, oh, you know, guess who I am, look who I am. You can ask any pastor here. We would be like, guess what? You want the job? Let the Lord give to you because of the responsibility that goes with it. A pastor is to equip the body. The teacher, you're being equipped now through a teaching gift that God has blessed me with. He's equipping you so you go home and you take in and you chew on what you heard and say, where do I fit in that? How yielded am I? How surrendered am I? How much of a witness do I bear to the world around me? Would people look at you and scratch their head and say, a Christian? 
Or would they say, yeah, there's something different about that person? I may not know what it is, but they don't go with the mainstream. They don't go with the flow. So the fivefold ministry is for the equipping of the saints, for the work of service, for the building up of the body of Christ until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge that is a heart intimate knowledge of the Son of God to a mature man, to the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ. Now, when people say, you know what, the fivefold ministry, that was for, you know, 2,000 years ago, it's not for now, this is what I'd like to say to them. Is the body of Christ fully in the unity of the faith? Is the body of Christ fully in the deep, intimate knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ? Is anybody sitting here saying, I've arrived, I'm the perfect specimen, here I am. Check me out, the perfect Christian. Have we arrived to the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ? No. So we're in a process that God is working us on. That's why he put in my heart, even when I open with prayer, pray that they're the clay and I'm the potter. You're on his wheel. He's, he's doing something in your life because he has an agenda. It's not for naught. Even the problems, troubles, disappointments, sadnesses that you are walking through, guess what? God is saying, you have to die so that I can live and you can carry out my message to that world that's screaming around you. It's all about dying to ourselves, church. It isn't about lifting yourself up in a lofty position. When, when people have done this, and they have done this, they have to stand before the Lord and answer to God. But we need to understand that our call in this house, whether we are pastoral, you know, Pastor Lisa and my husband are much more pastoral than I am. You can ask them. And I always say that because they labor, they labor. Now, I labor with people. I have a different calling on my life. It's probably more apostolic and a teacher and a prophetic that way. I'm more called to the broader body of Christ. That's not by my design. My knees shake when I think about it. I say, Lord, you've got to be kidding. You have to be kidding. See, he knows who I am. I'm not, yeah, are you kidding me? You know, you wake up in the morning like, this is nothing I would have ever decided for myself. I say this from the depths of my heart. They both know me. If I was just sitting in this church today, do you know where I'd be sitting? Right by that precious sister in the last row, minding my own business and just doing my own. That's who I am by choice, decision, temperament, and so forth. But God has another plan. Amen? So we need to understand and yield that that plan isn't about Carol, Lisa, or Joel, but God is saying, I'm going to use these people to edify, teach, proclaim, declare, pray for, train, disciple this group of people that he has called together. Make no mistake, you are here by divine calling. You're not here by accident. You didn't just say, I'm just showing up one day. I have nowhere else to go but be in Beth Page at 10 in the morning. It's the bidding of God that has called you forth, and you have responded. That's called obedience. That's obedience. And as you are obedient to the Lord, his agenda, his plan unfolds in you. So God wants us to equip the body of Christ to live a godly lifestyle in a lost, broken, and very rebellious world. We are to build up the body, not ourselves. It's not about an ego trip. It's not about a popularity contest. But it's all about what God has in mind. Let, let's look at our next PowerPoint. This is wonderful. So as a result of what we just read, as a result, once we are yielded under fivefold ministry, once we're saying, God, I'm going to be submitting to you on a daily basis, once we make that choice, 
there is a fruit, there's an evidence, there's a result, there's a manifestation. We see it in 414. So as a result of these things, we're what? No longer to be what? Let me, let me say something to everybody. Do you know how you remain a child? Cut yourself off from the body of Christ. I promise you, promise you, that as loved as that person may be by the Lord, there's no sign of maturity in them. None. You can only mature in the setting God says this setting will mature you. That's the body of Christ. That's the coming together, one with the other, yielding under leadership and authority, rubbing shoulders with everyone next door, and pouring out into other people. So once we do that, there's a result. There's the righteousness that comes forth, and we're not children anymore. We don't act like big baby wah-wah when something doesn't go our way. I won't look over there. Tossed here and there by waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine. Hello. Hello, Oprah. Hello, talk shows. Hello, all the doctrines. Everybody knows the doctrines. Everybody knows about God. Everybody knows everything. Too bad it's not true. Are you being taken in by every wind of doctrine? Is Oprah your pastor? I hope not. By the trickery of men, when people are not in the body, they have no discernment. It sounds good. Oh, it looks good. Everybody's doing it. It's got to be God. It's full of love. We love people. We love people. Really? I think there's a few things in the word of God God doesn't love. Do you know what they are? Or are you being lured deceived and taken out. Let me say to you, when you go home this week and you're reading Ephesians 4, read the first chapter of Hebrews, which says, Beware, church, though you drift away. People don't jump from being sold out in Christ to being anti-Christ. You know how that happens? They just drift, just a little bit. Can't get to church on Sunday. Just too tired. Oh, I'm busy. I got to get in my car. I can't read the word today. Oh, prayer? Hi, God, it's me. Would you bless me today? Oh, love one another? Ah, That person drives me nuts anyway. And there's just this drifting so subtle you don't even notice it till all of a sudden you're way down here and you look back and say oh my god how did I get here how much time of my life did I waste drifting away listen God loves us and God will take us back in a heartbeat but you have wasted the time you were allotted in your life. We have so many minutes and hours allotted. Everybody's got a, a, an appointment with the undertaker. And guess what? It's done. And I've lived long enough and ministered to enough people, including my own parents, that should you live long enough, you begin to hear the regrets of people of what they did not do or what they weren't yielded to in the Lord. You know, when you're younger and you're looking forward in life, you've got all the time in the world. We wrongly believe. Jesus said tomorrow's promise to no man. My brother died at 36 years old, like that, dropped dead. There was no more tomorrow. We can't waste our life thinking I have tomorrow in foolish ways. We need to be spending our time committed in Christ, committed to his call on our own life, whatever that is, committed to his body to see it come forth. That's the place you're going to grow 
and mature and become strong in your faith and strong in the word of God. The choice is up to you. Christ has done it. The ball is in your court. You have to make choices. So when we don't do those things, we can drift away and we get tossed here and there by waves, every wind of doctrine, trickery of men, craftiness and deceitful scheming. Yes, there are people who are scheming to rob you of everything they can rob you of because they operate under their father, the devil, who came to kill, steal, and destroy. We are to grow up in all into him who is the head, which is Christ, from whom the whole body, being fitted and held together by what every joint supplies, you supply something to this body no one else can supply. Are you supplying it? Nobody else can do it. So if you're not supplying it, there's a weakness that starts to happen, literally, within the body. Being fitted and held together by what every joint supplies, according to the proper working of each individual part, that's what causes the growth of the body for the building up of itself in love. Let me tell you something, church. We live in a day of great media. It's wonderful, and it can be used for tremendous good. I admire every true Christian show that is out there. They are marvelous. They are wonderful. But you are not going to call up Joel Osteen or Joyce Meyer when you have a problem. The one you're going to call is the pastor you're sitting under in that church who will be there for you because they have been in relationship with you. That's what the word is making such a point of here. Short of that relationship, you're just kind of out there on your own, doing your own thing, not growing, not maturing, listening to your own head, listening to some other probably ideas that are not grounded in the word of God. And so the Lord is literally saying to us in this word, I'm giving a warning. I want my church to understand this isn't a maybe. It's not, oh, you can not go to church and grow up somewhere, someday, somehow. There is no maybe in that. This is reality. Let's look at our last one. Verse 14 is literally saying to us what we just read. This is the result or the fruit of those who sit under God-ordained authority and yield their wills to who? The Holy Spirit's plan and guidance for them. You cannot mature as a Christian separate from the authority that God has set in order for his body to grow and mature. It's not going to happen. Maturity comes through what? Let's read that together. Maturity comes through obedience to God's ways. Not yours. Not yours. There is a growth process that needs to happen that is similar to being in a family unit. You need parents over you to train you, teach you, nurture you, guide you. You need peers that you rub alongside of whereby you develop the fruit of the Holy Spirit. And you need pupils. You need pu people that you are sowing into their life so that what you are receiving, you are giving out on a daily basis the way God desires. That is a Christian who's going to grow. You can't shortchange the growth process in Christ. If you do, you will pay a very dear price for it. Let's stand to our feet. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. That's no, okay. Thank you. Let's just bow our heads and really our hearts before the Lord. Just close your eyes.
and tune out everybody next to you for a moment. Just let it be between you and the Holy Spirit. And I want you to ask the Lord, do I yield myself to your authority, Lord, and to the authority that you've placed in your body? Or is that something that I resist and kick and scream about? How yielded am I? Yielding is a process. But am I willing, Lord, to really let you do in me what you're really looking to do? Father, we thank you that you have such a good plan for each and every person here, Lord. Lord, it does not matter what position they fill. Everyone is dear to you. And Father, we just ask by the power of your Holy Spirit, I pray that you would do a new work within each one of us. That, Lord, wherever we are not yielded and surrendered, we would begin to yield and surrender. I pray, Father, wherever we have held you at arm's length and resisted you, that that arm would come down and that, Father, you would do a deep work within the heart of every single one of us. Lord, you have a plan and a purpose. That's what your word has promised, and it's filled with good, never with evil, to give your children a future and a hope. Father, I pray that we walk that road with you, that we would not take ourselves off of that path that you have established for us, but that we would be a church that is growing into full maturity and full stature in Christ because we are a church, a people that are obedient to your word. Lord, I pray every heavenly blessing upon this body. I pray as we go home this week that you would minister this book of Ephesians to us as you have been, that we would see you and we would see ourselves and we would know, Lord God, the best is yet to come. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Have a blessed day today.